right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Easter Sunday. Uh, although I do think it's very fitting that we're talking about immigration today because the churches have often been a sanctuary for immigrant communities. Uh, so welcome, everyone. My name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am a candidate for the New York State Assembly in the 34th Assembly District, uh, representing the communities of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside. So when the coronavirus hit, we quickly shifted our regularly scheduled campaign events to focus on two things. Uh, we moved from door-to-door -door phone banking engagement and petitioning to conduct conducting phone banks every single night to check in on our neighbors and to offer mutual aid support. What this means is connecting our neighbors to resources, uh, any needs that they have, and we've been finding ourselves going out there and getting groceries and supplies and medication and toilet paper um, and making sure that our communities have the items that they need to survive while still fighting to ensure that our system and our uh, government is, is providing for the needs of our communities. Uh, we've also focused on virtual webinars on a series of topics that impact our district, as I would have had uh, town halls on issues. So we've already held uh, webinars on specific issues related to coronavirus itself, to homeschooling, to housing, uh, to managing mental health concerns, to natural remedies, to boost immunity, uh, criminal justice, cooking with food that you might have already in your house. And most recently, we had the New York director of the Working Families Party talk about the recently passed austerity budget that uh, the governor and the legislator passed and how it deeply and uh, harmfully impacts our communities. Uh, so if you miss any of these webinars, we have them all available on our website at votejgr.com backslash coronavirus. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been doing phone banking nearly every single night since March 15th. And we would love if you can join us and sign up for a shift. Uh, we've already reached thousands of our neighbors, but there's thousands of more to go. So if you can sign up at our website at votejgr.com backslash phone bank. Uh, so before I introduce our amazing guest, uh, activist and organizer and all around brilliant person, uh, Whitney Hugh, I want to share some logistics. Uh, so folks are automatically muted as we begin this conversation, but we do encourage your questions. So you can either click the chat button on the, uh, along the bottom of the screen and uh, pose a question to our moderator and I'll be sure to um, ask it during, uh, throughout the conversation, or you can um, hit participants and click raise hand. Um, and if you want to get on camera and, uh, and have your audio unmuted, um, we'd love to hear your voice as well. But whatever you're comfortable with, if you want to chat in your question, happy to read that out loud or to have you on video. Um, so this will is being recorded and um, also streamed on Facebook Live, um, but we'll also have a recording of this video available tomorrow and we'll be able to include Spanish subtitles for our monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, we're also streaming this through Facebook Live and we're live tweeting um, in both English and Spanish. So please follow the hashtag JGR webinar and please retweet. So we will wrap up at 7 p.m., but again, we'll be posting the video tomorrow for those who are unable to join us. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we know New York's immigrant population is especially vulnerable to this health crisis. And our district, District 34, which includes the neighborhoods of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside, is over 60% foreign born. Many are not able to qualify for relief due to their immigration status. They live in multifamily households where isolation is near impossible, or they don't have the privilege to be able to work from home, right? Many of our immigrant communities are on the front lines of being essential workers uh, and out there every single day putting their lives on the line to, to serve our community. Um, so we're so thrilled to have um, activist, organizer, all around badass, <laughs> Whitney Hugh, um, who will discuss the challenges facing our immigrant populations and what resources are out there and how do we continue the fight. Um, so Whitney, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. If you can start off by sharing a little bit about yourself, um, your work, your background, and um, please share what, what are the challenges for immigrant population in this moment uh, where the pandemic is impacting everyone, but most disproportionately impacting our communities. Definitely. Um, thank you so much, Jessica, for arranging this. And I know 
Um, it's Easter Sunday, so I'm really grateful for everyone who is taking time out of their schedule uh, to be with us as we sort of chat through some of this. So um, I live and am based in um, South Slope and organize within like some of the park and Red Hook out in South Brooklyn. And um, we are uh, in the area like a very high immigrant population. Um, 50% of the population it doesn't speak English. And so um, it's something that when the pandemic sort of descended upon the city, a lot of immigrant organizers, including myself and the council member's office and a few others came together to start talking about the specific needs that our folks are facing here. Um, I will also say I'm also um, an activist with Sunset Park Ice Watch, and so we respond a lot to ISIS activity um, among, like, across the city. Um, and so we'll also be talking a little bit about those particular challenges that we're facing. Um, so in pure nerd uh, form, I actually made a PowerPoint, so I would make sure I didn't leave anything out. And oops, let me see if I can share this. And I'd also say, um, I know, Jessica is an expert herself too. So if at any moment you want to like chime in and add something, like feel free to do so. So to kind of break down, I'm going to talk about four different verticals and there's a lot, but I think these are sort of the four top ones that come front of mind when it comes to how um, immigrant populations in New York City are being impacted particularly by COVID. Um, and you know, I'm going to start with like a breakdown of the impacted communities, um, talking a little bit about the lack of transited resources and funds, talk about how ICE is still arresting, still deporting folks, even during a pandemic, um, and then talk about the rise of anti-Asian sentiment and hate crimes. So I think a lot of folks saw this information come out recently, and it's like, not a surprise at all, I, I think, um, to many of us. So, you know, in New York City, what we're already seeing is that Hispanic and Latino populations, Black, you know, um, populations are the ones who are most heavily impacted right now by COVID, whether it's through confirmed cases, but also through deaths too. Um, and I think, you know, some organizers did flag too that we do think there's also like a severe underreporting of Asian deaths. Um, you know, if you expand what AAPI means beyond just East Asians and you start looking at like the Bangladeshi population, what organizers on the ground have felt and seen in their communities in terms of deaths have not been translated into this graph. And so um, a lot of people fear that that, you know, additional 917 where the race and ethnicity is unknown might actually um, be contributing to the low Lower number seen um, in the Asian line. So I think those are some things to kind of be incredibly aware of. And what we already know are that is that like Latinx populations are heavily overrepresented in service and janitorial occupations that at right now are deemed essential, but they often come without PPE and without paid sick leave. Um, and not to be said that like I, I think there's a dramatic need for PPE period. But I do think where people are more often to go donate or try to crowdfund tend to be healthcare facilities versus um, recently we were trying to make sure that some folks in NYCHA housing, especially the janitors who are going around sanitizing, um, post office workers, like folks who are also deemed essential and about are also getting the same access to PPE, um, especially because um, as we're seeing from the data, they're incredibly vulnerable. Um, to getting COVID. And when you start looking at the demographics and then you start looking at to where the city, I, I think has honestly failed in, in terms of making sure resources are getting out, um, I think there's a lot of correlations. So in New York from the last census, um, we know that 2.5 million New Yorkers face limited English proficiency. And you know, and this is a lot of this is like anecdotal at the moment, but I think um, once things sort of settle and we, we start doing more um, research on this, we're going to see that the city really did take a long time to get translated resources out. Um, the city's tech system, the 626626, um, that was Councilmember Menchaca's office that really pushed for them to finally get a Spanish version. Um, but no surprise, the links that they often link to within that 626 text often send them to websites that are in English. Um, and when you think of like accessibility, like a lot of the resources um, 
that the city has provided have gone through these sort of digital channels um, that oftentimes aren't translated or even distributed um, in ways that feel equitable. And so the fact that communities of color have been more severely impacted um, I, I think is a real big cause of alarm. Um, oftentimes, and in, in the way that a lot of folks have sort of organized on the ground is, um, like I myself was having friends translate information for small businesses, translating um, basic information about how to even get in the queue for testing. Um, New York Immigration Coalition has really great translations and they have expanded it to include like Simplified Chinese, Haitian Creole, um, other languages that but for besides like the most basic things on the city's website, um, you can't find properly translated. Um, and I think that is like something that immigrant organizers in, in particular have been feeling incredibly frustrated about. And, and I think maybe um, other folks on this line have, have probably felt too. Um, and then it, you know, when all of a sudden you realize that the city isn't even translating information. There's now a lot of research coming out that our own healthcare system has been unable to properly communicate with non-English speakers. Um, ProPublica had a really great article come out about how those who come in, there aren't enough interpreters that have been um, on duty. Um, 311 calls haven't been able to handle folks properly. So we're not, not even sure if people are getting triage properly. Um, and basic, you know, I, I think when it comes to just a basic awareness campaign where other folks knew right away to like wear masks and to quarantine, um, folks who weren't speaking English might have gotten that information a little bit later in the game. And I think that, you know, when we know that just a couple of days can sort of change how a community, um, how a community's number is reflected towards um, the spread. Um, I think the fact that our communities of color who don't speak English were left out of the loop for so long, um, I think really exasperated the numbers that we see. Um, you know, I was told on a call from an elected that if I wanted anything from the city to properly translate it, that it would take me one to two weeks and I should just translate it myself. And I thought that was atrocious um, and unforgivable. <laughs> um, and then in terms of, you know, and I kind of want to do like me doing a snapshot of like what I think is horrible, but then also what I think we can do as a community in terms of action. I think we should always be demanding the city to translate and bring on more interpreters. I think this is something that the city needs to include within their ideas and their asks for um, COVID-19 in terms of resources that they need. Um, we are not a community of, of, we are New York City, like where folks are speaking, you know, hundreds of different languages and dialects. Um, and so making sure that when we are talking about accessibility, that we're also making sure that language justice is included in that conversation. Um, I also think in terms of making sure that organizers and folks on the ground who are doing this work feel empowered. And so um, really looking towards like nonprofits and advocacy organizations who do have the great translated resources at the moment. Um, I hate to say it, but sometimes like printing off what the city has created isn't the best way to reach out to folks. It might be looking for a better translation. Um, and New York Immigration Coalition tends to have things that are like properly translated versus using online web services. And then the second part that we sort of tie into is also like the barrier around emergency funds. Um, I think even for native speakers right now trying to access like unemployment and whatnot can be incredibly confusing. And so adding in the language barrier and then adding in the fact that a lot of things are tied to social security numbers, we're seeing that even our most like vulnerable folks and the ones who are the most highly impacted are also the ones who are limited from the most access to funds, which is um, another frustrating thing that I think a lot of folks are seeing. Um, so right now I wrote off a few things that are tied to social security numbers and you'd be surprised like how much people just don't realize that because the amount of electeds have told me like, well, just like reach out to HRA and I'm like, but I cannot um, is really high. So um, 
food stamps, um, HRAs, cash assistance. So if you need rent assistance or like an emergency check that you could kind of request that through um, Human Resources Administration, Administrative Administration. Um, those are all tied to social security numbers. Receiving the stimulus check, and this also does you know, impact mixed status families uh, that's tied to a social security number. Um, and also um, something that we are having to talk about now is like, especially with the high rate of folks who are passing away from COVID, funeral assistance. So the city does have a program where folks can get, you know, around $900 for like um, to cover burials. But if you do not have a social security number, you don't get to access those funds. Um, and so that's something that it's just like another layer of, of what we're having to organize around. And um, I've been having conversations of like, what does it look like to crowdfund for a funeral and how much money does that take? And then knowing that we need to do it for folks who are undocumented. Um, I will also say there are a few things for the city's program that aren't tied to social security numbers. Uh, so the free grab and go meals from the schools, City Harvest's senior meals, food pantries, mutual aid groups, um, and a lot of the nonprofits and churches in the communities who've been doing this work for a long time. Um, so there are some resources, but I think when it comes to like actual, like large amounts of cash versus like some one-off meals, um, a lot of that, and, and I think like long-term help with like food stamps is tied and not even including unemployment. Um, those are all tied. There are a few things when it comes to like the city, when it comes to testing, at least in New York City, um, status does not impact whether or not you can get tested. But I do think the barrier to fighting for that and the knowledge of that is where the limitations um, will be impacting folks. Uh, in terms of some actions that you can do and, and some of the work that I think some electives are starting to do is like demanding the city to remove the social security provision or provide a separate emergency fund because some of those funds do come from the federal level. But what does it look like for the city to provide separate emergency funds that aren't necessarily tied um, to those um, prevent, uh, preventative measures? Um, I'd also say donate. Donate as much as you can if you are able to, if you have that privilege. Um, and really encouraging folks to donate a part of their stimulus checks to folks who are undocumented, who are often essential workers who are um, not being given the support. Um, I do link, and I can share this out after, um, Steka um, has a fund for undocumented people and they're doing it citywide. Um, so that might be a great place. And I'm sure there are some within your own community that you can go looking for, um, which might be a great place to donate your stimulus check or a part of it, um, and making sure that those funds are reaching out, reaching to folks who need it. And then on top of all of it, just everything that is that is sort of impacting folks, um, ICE is still active. Um, and then I, I can't even explain how like infuriating this is. So like um, since January and what we've really seen has been like an uptick. Um, President Trump said that he needed to see at least 17,000 more people arrested in sanctuary cities. And so since January, we've seen an uptick of brutal um, arrests and, and um, a lot of signs that they are looking at um, NYPD arrest records and going after folks and sort of sentencing folks to, to um, being detained versus giving them their fair time in, in court. Um, I will, in the way that I sort of frame that is like a good example is the shooting that we saw in Gravesend, Brooklyn, um, where I shot a man in the face and then ended up tasing um, another unarmed person about 15, 16 times. That entire horrific incident came from um, an illegal license plate. So if you ever wanna know the sort of criminals that ICE is going after. Oftentimes, folks haven't been proven guilty in courts. Um, they're sort of acting on warrants through NYPD, and their sort of claim is that like NYPD isn't going to do it, so we're going to do it, um, and it's really atrocious. And so, we've seen high numbers um, even prior. 
um, ICE has remained active and it's something that they, they did like a weird article in the New York Times or Washington Post a few weeks ago being like, this is how we're arresting people during a pandemic. We wear gloves and a mask. So like that's, that's ICE's prerogative. Um, there are ways to like shame ICE. ICE is kind of like an interesting entity because like technically people aren't proven guilty of anything besides like immigration law. So it's something that federal judges can like overrule at times. Um, and you can shame ICE a lot and so when they were asking for PPE people like shamed them until they stopped and I think that's like the sort of tactics we have to use. Um, ICE is also still actively deporting detainees to Latin America and Caribbean countries um, and they recently were, were trying, where was it, it was like, I forget where, but they were trying to to deport someone recently who actually had tested positive for COVID-19. And so they're getting a lot of pushback on that, but it is something that they're still actively trying to deport folks. Um, immigration detention centers alongside Rikers, jails, MDC, other prisons, um, they're also facing hunger strikes and really fearful of the coronavirus um, that's spreading on the inside. A lot of um, folks have been tested. Um, and in New York City, um, a lot of our undocumented folks are actually taken to New Jersey. Um, and so there's been a lot of protests at like Essex and Hudson and Bergen. Um, there's like a small silver lining. So ICE has technically started releasing folks at night um, who they, feel like they can, um, which shows you just how arbitrary ICE is. Um, and um, that's been like a struggle itself because they often like aren't properly communicating to lawyers that somebody has been released. We don't know if they have shelter. Um, we're trying to run Ubers at midnight to try to go pick people up. Um, and federal judges and lawyers have been working like over time to try to get folks released, um, oftentimes citing like medical issues. Like there's a high barrier. It's a lot of paperwork, um, but that's some of the fight that people are doing. So there's a lot of movements to hashtag like free them all. Um, and I definitely recommend getting becoming a part of those. There's been car rallies. Um, there's ways to protest even during a pandemic. And so people have been doing car rallies. Um, I've been participating in a lot of like socially distanced protests where you stand six feet apart, but you're still making noise. Um, calling Governor Cuomo and Murphy, calling federal reps like Schumer and Gillibrand and Nidia Velasquez and them calling DAs, calling mayors, um, and really pushing to make sure that they're not forgetting folks who are sitting behind bars. Um, the other way you can kind of do it is to actually just pay people's bail. And so Let My People Go is um, between the New York Immigration Coalition, uh, J. Fredge, and Brooklyn Bail Fund, um, and New Sanctuary Coalition. So if you do look for their bail fund, uh, they're working actively to get people out of ICE um, detention. Um, there is also a general COVID bailout NYC on Venmo that you can donate to. Um, I think to date they've gotten 60 people out on like bail and parole. And so those are some like great places to donate to and, and to actively think about um, removing folks who, you know, right now Rikers has the highest transmission rate. So um, something to think about. And then, um, this is the fun one. Um, Anti-Asian sentiment and hate crimes are also on the rise. Um, so, and, and this is like, this one I have like, I have like a lot of like deep rooted feelings around and it's, it's really complicated. I am, you know, I think a lot of like the lack of response and preparedness around COVID-19 had a lot to do with like Americans just not seeing, um, Asian deaths is, is incredibly meaningful to oneself. And, and I don't know how to like phrase that in an eloquent way, but I, I think it's the fact that, you know, if this had happened maybe anywhere else besides China or, um, ha or happened in a European country, I hate to say like based within like whiteness, um, I think folks would have been like doing like hashtag Wuhan strong and like really concerned and worried about an epidemic <laughs> or a pandemic. Um, but I think because it felt so far away in China, people were joking about it in a way that was really hard to see. Um, my, so mo most of my family has like immigrated to the US, but um, my dad has coworkers in China. And so it was really tough because to hear their personal narratives and also to see how the US was treating it was like a tale of two different things and people really weren't paying attention to it. Um, 
so when folks kind of, when COVID started becoming more of a real thing, um, the places that were impacted the, the quickest were like Chinatowns and like, um, like organizing like in Flushings and Sunset Park and Manhattan Chinatown, you will see that a lot of businesses have been closed way prior to the pandemic. Um, and that was just purely based off like tourists not frequenting it as much and people in New York not going out as much. And I think actually, to be honest, like I think um, the Asian community who took it more seriously started self-isolating quicker too. Um, that, you know, always, you know, I mean, Chinese communities wear the mask more based out of like trauma from SARS, but like, you know, also wearing masks more often. Um, it's no surprise, like, you know, if you ask people this, they, they would think that COVID-19 in New York came from China, but um, when they were actually doing tests, they saw that most of them came from cases in New York, um, actually came from Europe and other places in the U.S. Um, and I didn't think that's like a surprise to a lot of people. Like nobody shunned Little Italy, but, and not that I would want people to shun Little Italy, but um, I, I think that's, that's some of the like racism that was kind of based within people not understanding how a virus doesn't see race it, it spreads that way but when people kind of tied it geographically to china um and it's kind of ironic that you know anti-asian sentiment is rising um considering that like 17 percent of doctors are asian and and nine percent of um, physician assistants are asian and 10 percent of nurses are asian and so the healthcare industry like does heavily rely on asian folks but um, I think like for myself, even just like a few weeks ago, I was writing the Amtrak and I had two white women in front of me look at me and say they didn't want to catch the Chinese disease and they left and went to the other cart. Um, and I think that's something that we're hearing a lot. Um, there was like a recent case in the New York Post where they think a woman had um, acid poured on her because she was Chinese. Um, there was a New York Times reporter who got like verbally assaulted and, and for being Chinese. Um, there's been a lot of organizers that I work with who've been yelled at if they're not seen wearing a mask um, and have been harassed and, and I think um, are starting to feel that. So since, um, April 3rd, we've seen over 1,100 self-reported incidences of harassment, shunning, or assault. Um, and I think we're going to see more of it. And so I think in terms of ways to stay proactive, it's like reporting incidences. So there's two ways to do it. Um, there is a... Um, AAPI nonprofit that's collecting narratives, but also through the city's um, human rights um, department, you can also report there too. And they've been, they've been proactive and like, a hotel decides to kick somebody out because they think they have COVID or they're coughing. So like, that's where like, I think the faster response, you can kind of get that through the human rights department. Um, and then Hollaback also has a bystander training that's specific towards anti-Asian sentiment um, that I think I like actually got to sit in on as they sort of tested it out, which was super great. And so if you're noticing in your communities, like a rise of anti-Asian sentiment, then it might be worth trying to check out that bystander training. Um, but yeah, it's the otherness of, of, of like the Asian community, I think is gonna be felt really hard. And, and I think, to be honest, like I'm not even sure after the quarantine is lifted, if our Chinatowns are going to bounce back like other small businesses will, just because I'm not sure how long that they're going to be distanced from just purely based off of um, perception versus the actual truth of how COVID-19 spread. So um, yeah, sad note on there. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are some of the, the wider, and I, I feel like this is such a sad subject to have on, on Sunday, but I think it's something that I was sort of describing. If you wanted to ask how I felt, like as somebody who, who organized a lot around immigrant justice, how I felt during COVID-19, I joke, and I, but I don't think I'm joking. I feel like the angry Elmo gif where he's just like raising his hand up in flames um, because I feel like our communities have been repeatedly let down by the government and, and not even let down, ignored by the government, um, disrespected by the government. Um, and in ways that we can now point at the numbers to say that like our communities have felt that 
and, and they felt it because we have lost community members. Um, so I think like in terms of next actions, like I think we just need, we need people to be talking about this outside of our communities. Um, I think it's no surprise that the only, you know, electives talking about like, you know, hate crimes tends to be Asian representatives and we have very few of them. Um, that the only folks talking about language justice are like from the immigrant communities. And so I think that's something where like we need folks to be pushing and pushing and pushing because this will only change if we get resources and if we get funding and if we get that um, because it's not enough to highlight it. It's like I want that equity in terms of funds um, because it's going to allow us to do the work to actually start changing the tide. Um, yeah, so I think that's sort of my like rambling that I'm going to like end on. Um, Jessica, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add to it. I feel like I sort of like rambled. Oh, this is awesome, Whitney. This is so, and I actually have like a page full of notes because um, this is really, really important for my community. Um, as you know, Whitney, this our, our community, this district has been the hardest hit. We are, Elmhurst Hospital is right down the street. I literally hear sirens all day. Um, and there was a recent New York Times article that specifically pointed out how the immigrant population was disproportionately impacted and disproportionately marginalized from all the services that and resources that are out there. And as I think about that slide about what is what resources are available and what's tied to Social Security and what's not, and essentially the only things that are not tied to Social Security numbers are majority are from nonprofits and churches. Yeah. Right. That shouldn't be discriminating anyway, but it's, it's not the government, right? It's not the, the entity that is, a, it's, it's supposed to ensure that there's a strong safety net for all of us in this moment. Yeah. And that is absolutely infuriating because these are the folks, like I said earlier, they're on the front lines, right? They're the people who are still out there delivering our food, um, still out there, uh, you know, cleaning a lot of these, these places and being exposed to the virus, um, caring for others, right? It's, it's just, we, we know the, the blood, sweat, and tears that our immigrant communities put into this country and in this, in this city. Um, and I'm, as someone who's been an immigrant justice advocate my entire life, it's, it's uh, so infuriating and, and actually really upsetting. Um, my God, I have so, so many questions. Um, one not tied into like sustainable models of support, right? Like mutual aid, nonprofits, like they're all there to sort of, you know, fill in the cracks when somebody needs help, right? Like we can kind of come together and crowdfund and, and help out our neighbors in this time of need. Um, but we don't have the money or the deep pockets of the government to pay for like routine, weekly, like unemployment checks to make sure that people can like survive and thrive. We mm -hmm. can't, like I can't crowdfund enough and, and I don't think any nonprofit can crowdfund enough. Um, you know, like the only places that can like raise taxes and revenues is like the state and the federal um and if we're tapped out from that then like our community suffer um if they're not able to tap into those like longer like revenues exactly yeah I, as much as you know we're stepping in and doing our own mutual aid efforts as much as i've i've contributed to more gofundme accounts than i wish i you know than than i should be um it, it it's important and great that like our communities are pulling together resources to to serve people in this moment in this crisis, but it is, it is a Band-Aid. It is a Band-Aid on uh, a system that we all know, right, as activists, as people have been working on the front lines, working alongside our immigrant uh, communities that we know has, has failed us. And now it's just like blown open and exposed the, the real, real harm that a system that does not serve everyone, what it does and what it means and actually how it can harm everyone, right? This is a public health crisis. Um, and this is a humanity, a crisis of humanity. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm with you and feeling like that angry Elmo with the like flames in the background because, you know, just learning about the stimulus package, one thing that's important to uplift is that families who are mixed status. So if there's someone in your family uh, who, you know, there's a U.S. citizen, someone who may have a green card, but if someone uses an ITIN number, right, which, it, which they're paying taxes, they're paying taxes, but those families are excluded from their stimulus checks. So, you know, it makes me infuriated. And, and, it's, and, and again, it, it highlights the need for the nonprofits, the churches, the mutual aid groups, but it is not a long-term solution. And it's why we need people of color and folks from immigrant 
backgrounds and communities and, you know, black, Latino, Asian American uh, folks to run for office because we understand those experiences and we bring those voices to the, to the table. So um, I, I, it's just something I'm just really, really passionate about and really angry about in this moment. Yeah. So, um, one thing I want to say that's come up in our community, um, and I'm not sure if you have an answer. It seems to be like there is no answer, but I just want to see if you've looked into it or if you found any uh, band-aids for this problem. Um, many uh, Nepalese and Bangladesh communities um, in Jackson Heights, uh, their leaders have reached out around finding hotel rooms for um, families that are in close quarters, either families or roommates. Um, that are in close quarters where someone's feeling symptoms, right? They may not be bad enough to have to go to the hospital or don't want to be exposed to it even further in the hospital or have gone and have been released but have then been exposed to the virus while being at Elmhurst Hospital uh, and are told to just self-quarantine but they don't have the space um, in, their, in their homes or in their apartments or whatever spaces they're, they're living in to self-quarantine. So I'm working really hard with a couple of like nonprofits and a couple of electeds. Um, we're not having any luck on our end, but I'm wondering if you've seen any solutions there. And, you know, we, we talked earlier about a housing uh, crisis, but it, it, can you share what, what housing and shelter mean for the people who are, and many immigrant populations who are on these cramped, cramped quarters? Yeah. Um, that like shelter has been like one of the like toughest questions to answer and it's always it's like always a tough one um even outside of like pandemic terms mm -hmm. because it's the most expensive and it's like the hardest to like find and in a way that feels like sustainable and, and nice because if anybody has been in our shelter system it's, it's severely like underfunded and and isn't um a place that a lot of folks want to be in um that's a tough one i feel like I feel like when we look at how other countries are responding with like hotels and then we see how like we are responding to hotels, um, it like adds more like Elmo anger reactions because um, we aren't tapping into the hotels in New York City. We have like over 100,000 empty rooms as we speak. Um, right now, the city has really only tapped into barely, I would say like barely 10,000. Um, and they only recently have put 6,000 folks into um, 6,000 folks from homeless, um, from, uh, homeless folks into hotel rooms with like another 23,000 to go. Um, so I think that's like a demand in terms of like emergency powers to really push both de Blasio and Cuomo at the same time, because right now, like the city's emergency powers have to be approved by Cuomo. And we already know that Cuomo is putting his like hands on everything the city does because I hate don't like him <laughs> that's my that's my that's my my that's the nicest version of the answer that I have um, and so I, I think that's becomes like a really big pressure campaign that we have to really place on them is to really prioritize getting people access to shelters like it should it should not be a question that like the moment that we need to start like isolating folks in that hotel rooms are a really great way to do that like in other countries they have it where the moment you even step off of a plane like they put you into a hotel room there's food there's water they do temperature checks and you get a test and that's how you make sure that COVID-19 doesn't spread mm -hmm. um, we know that like things spread around like folks are homeless they spread in like closed cramped quarters um and so yeah I, I think that's like something that just needs like a lot more like advocacy around because you know we there are groups that can crowdfund like a hotel room for like a week but it's not sustainable um and yeah and and i mean this is like more controversial but like man, we could start looking at that airbnb market that for a long time has been leeching off of new york city and like you know, causing and creating homelessness and, and seeing how we can tap into the very many vacant buildings that are right now in the city. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, just for folks on the line, a reminder that you can chat in your question or you can um, hit participants and raise hand to get on camera. Um, Whitney, I want to ask about the census. So we're gonna actually do a webinar on a census on Wednesday, but I think this is all interconnected. So we're in a moment where, you know, the census is happening, everyone's got their mail, the information in the mail. Uh, I, they're pausing on the door-to-door -door enumeration 
Um, but there is a need to make sure that we're all counted. While this pandemic is happening, while ICE is still going after our communities, um, how do you, how does all this interplay in your activism and, and what are some things that our communities, our immigrant populations should be aware of in this moment? Yeah. Um, man, I, like the census is stressing me out so much because it's like every route that we sort of have, have tried to create, like there's always kind of something in the way, whether it's like ice over patrolling the area or now a pandemic. Um, I think I have like two, two things about this. Like mutual aid efforts are really interesting right because like it's the first time that you're seeing in a long time where like people are just sort of like reaching out to their neighbors in a way that like even the best census organizing i don't think could replicate um because you have people who are i think are feeling really proactive or in the spirit of like solidarity and you know i run a i like i help with a few other organizers run like the south brooklyn mutual aid group and so our follow-up messages we have like here are some like tapped in long-term resources for you like here's a food pantry but also like fill out the census because if there's like ever a moment where we can clearly see that our communities need more funding and need more need it's like based within the census um and really pushing to folks that it doesn't ask about immigration status and the second thing is, is if you're filling it out online you don't need a census id number mm -hmm. um the UX is so bad and it's like tucked underneath the submission button, but I've had to tell multiple people like you can bypass if you don't have a census ID number and fill it out anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, it feels like, uh, it feels just like one more touch that we have to add into like any flow that we're setting up right now is to constantly be pushing the census because if we want to continue to do this work or God forbid, it's like the next time we have a disaster on our hands, like we're going to want those funds. And so um, I've been trying to really push it to folks, like even though we have this like immediate need to talk about food and securities and shelter, it's to not forget that we do have the census to fill out. And I don't think we're going to get any relief from an extension or anything like that. So, yeah. Um, we have a question about detention centers. So you mentioned earlier that um, people were being released and it's been very arbitrary. Um, and I think there's definitely an alignment with a lot of the criminal justice efforts to release people who are in uh, Rikers and other prisons and jails around New York uh, to grant pardons. Can you talk more about that effort and what is being done, what advocacy perhaps we can engage in to continue to push? Um, but what, what is that looking like right now? Because I always feel like in some of these calls, immigrant detention centers are often forgotten. So I'm always like ringing the bell on that. Um, but can you talk about the interplay between some of the activism around releasing vulnerable populations from prisons and jails and detention centers? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a weird thing that like we always keep like detention centers and like jails and prisons separate, even though like detention centers are often like a lot of states will build contracts with ICE through their prison systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so a really good thing to, that I always try to remind both like immigration activists and those who um, um, abolitionists is like, it's the same carceral system. Like it's the same system. Like, like there's no like separate distinction. Um, you know, I recently, I was like broken window policing is just as detrimental to the immigration community because mm -hmm. like anytime NYPD picks somebody up, and like, even if it's something super minor on their record or the DA holds them for a super minor record, that triggers ICE. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like you know, we like that, that little like arrest on the subway will trigger like ICE to come and detain and deport that person without any like due process. And there's no, there's no kind of hiding that. Um, New Jersey recently passed a whole bunch of bail reform, which was super great. Um, and so a lot of black folks were released, but then they filled those because I'm new, new plug that I have mm -hmm. prisons don't stay empty. They filled those prisons with immigrant bodies. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Yeah. So like it's the same system. It's all piled in together. And what, um, in terms of like advocacy, it's kind of like weird. It's like, you know, because like state prisons, you know, we, we want to fight for cl emergency clemency, um, records, like we need the mayor to move, um, federal prisons and ICE detention centers are weird because like the person that can do pardons is like Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if like, I like, 
you know, unless Kim Kardashian comes in, like it ain't happening. <laughs> um, and so like, cause I do a lot of advocacy around like MDC in Brooklyn. So like, that's a tough spot. So then you're looking to look at more of like, how do we like remove folks? Like, what is it to like advocate, you know, bar and, and like the, the department of justice and like, and, and, and they're starting to have those conversations. Like, mm-hmm. um, with detention centers, I think a lot of it is like advocating and pushing ice itself, pushing the, um, ice directors that are in, um, both New York and in, um, New Jersey, um, I think is pushing federal judges. And I think it's really pushing for folks um, and trying to get them as many resources. The The hardest thing is like, ICE doesn't tell us when they take someone. Um, what we often get is like a report. So like, you would think Sunset Park ICE Watch, we were like tiny detectives because like for an example of a case that we like advocated through, um, somebody was on the bus, thought they saw ICE, took a photo, sent it to us, we looked at the photo, figured out where they were located, went to that person, talked to the wife, went to the husband's wow. place, found the cameras, got the video footage, tracked him down, figured out what detention facility he was, lobbied a lawyer to take his case because the lawyer was like, mm, we don't know, like he has a really tough case. So then we like sat on the lawyer until they took up the lawyer's case. And then two months later, he was released from, wow. and, and that's, because ICE doesn't give anyone a warning. So um, I think that's the thing too, is like making sure people have lawyers to like hound on their case. Cause like having a lawyer will change whether or not you're released by like, you know, a hundred, 200%. Um, but I think that's just like, it just needs to get to the point where like, I think something we really want to advocate is for what does it look like for states to not take contracts with ICE. Um, and that is something they can do. And, you know, there's some like interesting, like, does that mean people get removed farther away? But I think um, it would increase our chances of getting folks to be released. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, so we're almost at time. So Whitney, I want to give you a chance to share, uh, again, any calls to action that you want our participants to take part in. Uh, you mentioned really good resources to donate to, and I'm going to add some at the end. Um, but what's, what's, if folks can maybe take one action, what, what would you like folks to do? Ooh, um, <laughs> I know there's so much. There's so much. I think, or a couple things. <laughs> I think maybe I'll do two. Okay. Um, I think at this moment, we really, really need to hammer at the city to fill in the gaps in terms of funding and providing resources for immigrant communities. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like, if this, if people can't, you know, like, what does it look like for us to have like an undocumented, um, like so I've always kind of wanted it was like a vulnerable workers fund Mm -hmm. um and it's something that I really believe in is like it's almost like unemployment for folks who are undocumented Mm -hmm. um you know we do have like an emergency like abortion access fund through the city so like what does that like actual money look like in terms of making sure people are getting cash so they could pay rent so they can go out and buy their own groceries so they can have some dignity during this this crisis and I think that's something we could push the city. It's going to be tough because like the city has to have a balanced budget, but there are ways that we can take money out that doesn't come from like canceling summer jobs for, you know, people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing I would push is donate. Uh, and, like if you really want to like get money to where things need to go, like look at a nonprofit, look at a mutual aid group, look at a fund um, and donate as much as you possibly can or with your stimulus check. And if you yourself can't donate, you know, highlight and elevate it and really push folks to, um, I think a lot of folks, you know, I love that everybody is baking bread and everything like that. And, um, but there are folks with real food insecurities and empty fridges and that's where our money should be channeled to and like, you know, and participating in that sort of solidarity comes with funds. Absolutely. Um, and I want to uplift four organizations um, in Queens that um, people should really support. Well, one is citywide, um, but Make the Road Action or Make the Road New York. Um, they're doing outreach to um, undocumented populations, those who have those food insecurities um, for resources. New Immigrant Community Empowerment is an organization that's near and dear to my heart. I was on the founding board in 1999 <laughs> when we got started. We were really a scrappy group of local activists um, and, again, a community that is overwhelmingly immigrant. And um, I'm very proud of what it's become, a really thriving 
uh, worker center and one that really centers the lives of immigrant workers who are most marginalized. Um, there's a food pantry called La Jornada that is doing amazing work and feeding so many families. And this, these again are the type of resources in which immigrants can utilize without a social security number. So please, please contribute to them. And there's also a campaign called uh, One Fair Wage that has a, uh, a fund as well for service workers who have lost their jobs. And we, again, we know many of the people in the service industry are immigrant um, families and, and brothers and sisters. So. Um, I want to uplift those four organizations, Make the Road, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, La Jornada, and the One Fair Wage Campaign. Um, so Whitney, I want to thank you. Any last words um, that you want to share? No, thank you so much um, for pulling this together. And thanks to everyone who came out on a Sunday evening to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. This is wonderful. Really, really timely, really amazing resources. Um, I'm glad to get this out there. Um, you know, on the website and on Facebook Live as well. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your work. It's incredible and incredibly important um, and, and we need you doing it. So I'm very thank grateful you. for you. Um, and then for folks, um, again, we meet on Sundays and Wednesdays and sometimes we have a bonus uh, webinar, but this Wednesday we have Ingrid Gomez and it'll be bilingual in English and Spanish. So we'll be talking about the census 2020, why it's so important to fill it out, what does it mean for our communities and to answer any questions. And again, I hold the immigrant lens, right? How does this impact our immigrant populations under uh, President Trump um, and when we're taking a census in this moment, but why, why it's so critical that all our people and communities are counted. So um, join us on Wednesday um, and thank you all so much for, for being with us. And again, thank you, Whitney, for your amazing work and your brilliance. No, thank you. Bye. And thank you for the work you do. Appreciate you. Bye everyone. Bye.